One of the um, conditions of living together and working together is you need some refuge, some kind of escape. So we found this place, this really simple um, cottage in Connemara in the west of Ireland and we um, come here to think, come here to walk and um, come here to kind of regroup ourselves. I want to get to the bottom of what Codon Montumi's architecture is all about, where it comes mm -hmm. from from where it's going to. So let's begin with the, the pre O'Donnell and Toomey days. Being a student then, 1971, um, was in the kind of aftermath of the 1968-69 student um, upheavals. So I think as we advanced in college, we, I mean, a lot of the time we met each other in the library, hiding out from avoiding studio tutorials and hiding out from other duties that we were supposed to be following up. I mean, I. First, a couple of times we we did different projects than I mean that's how we got together is because we, we we proposed doing different projects than the staff had proposed, and Sheila and I finally probably got together because we were writing manifestos against the teaching program. Um, were you putting anything up in its stead? Hmm, yeah, 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 yeah. But they they we were doing um, pure early Corb <laughs> because we went to see Corb in the summer holidays of third year. So yeah. we came back and I think a group of us, not just us, but mm. four or five of yeah. us kind of were corp for the first term mm. of the fourth year. And it caused a lot of upset because I think the tutors thought we were um, kind of being jokey or cynical. And we were absolutely sincerely trying to make amazing buildings on the quays in Dublin with ramps up and different coloured plaster. And No, we would say to each other, where did you get that window? Oh, we got, I got that on, on page 27, you know, it's the one on the left beside the um, studio or, or that ramp with that stairs. You know, we, we were just, we used to core uh, complete works as a cookbook and did our yeah, products it out was, of that. It caused a lot of, a lot mm. of upset and I think mm. probably, yeah, I think that that was probably the beginning, it was the end of that same year we started writing the manifestos. Mm. But, uh, but we went through core, but I think we moved on to brutalism after core and then Russian constructivism. Um, but all those were things that we sort of, did in the library, you know, went and read and they had very good books, as John said, it was a good library, so we were able to follow those things. And then we became aware of Rossi's work, which was yeah. just, he was just starting to do in Europe, and that seemed a really sort of shocking in a way and interesting, because because we were still back being Russian constructivists or brutalists, mm. and so it was quite a sudden shock to find mm. someone who's returning to the values of the European city. Um, and did, uh, did Jim Sterling cross your consciousness at that time? Yes, he yeah. did. He came to lecture um, when we were in second year. He came to lecture to the Architectural Association of Ireland. During my summers, I went to see quite a lot of his buildings in, in England. You know, I went to travel to see um, his works. And I think we were very influenced by his small amount of his writing that we got our hands on. He wrote a Architect's Approach to Architecture and he was, uh, when we were in about fourth year, I remember, and you kind of knew every word that he had written d down, you know, about, um, uh, I believe buildings should indicate, probably even display the way of life of their occupants, and their expression is unlikely to be simple. Or, you know, I mean, we had all these kind of slogans in our head that you would write on the bottom of your drawings. Um, so he was a big influence because, of course, he combined... Um, Russian constructivism, <laughs> early core brutalism, <laughs> like he yeah. was, he just came right into our uh, basket and um, he's also a uh, turn the tables over kind of person and as you probably uh, understand, we, um, rebelliousness was in the air and um, the, actually what happened is that Ed Jones, who was a visiting critic when we were in college, um, told me to send my thesis drawings to Sterling. And I had only a small portion of money at that point, but I got my drawings photographed down to postcard size and I put them in a letter and sent them to Jim. And I got a temporary job, well, for me, a temporary job in Covent Garden in an office that I wasn't enjoying. And I got no reply from Sterling's. And it was Friday, the end of my first week in that office. And I was annoyed to be where I was and Sheila wasn't there. And uh, I rang up Sterling's office 
to say, I sent you my drawings and I haven't had a reply. And the very nice secretary, Cathy, Scottish woman, said, well, we answer every letter. And I said, well, you didn't answer mine. You know, it's just stupid. And um, she said, well, there's only one reason we wouldn't have answered a letter, and that's if your letter is on Mr. Starling's desk. Hold the line. And uh, I held the line, and then this voice came on and said, hello, nice drawings. Can you start on Monday? <laughs> and I, I said, Monday? Of course, absolutely. Um, it was a time when everybody, but there was very little work around. And I think the same, at one point, about two years into our stay in London, we both were made, given the given the, the sack, it's not the sack, we're both you know, let go because there's no work. Everyone in Sterling's office was let go, everyone in our office was let go at the same week. So we all went off, myself and John and our friends, right. Uli Shad and Bernard yeah. Christ, drove to Rome. We went, decided we'd take a holiday and we drove down in a little Volkswagen Beetle down through Switzerland to Rome to look at Borromini and Bernini and people. And while we were there... Um, Sterling won the Stuttgart competition and of course couldn't get in touch with all the people he'd let go because there were no mobile phones, wasn't it? But somehow someone phoned the office and Jim said, where the hell are you? Why don't you get back here now? In the process of trying to resolve the geometric complexity of, of the elevations of Stuttgart, I was making these drawings. So I started making drawings in plan which were projected vertically in planar projection, like elevations projected into the sky to try to work out the geometry of these canopies and the proportion of the elevation. And I made a series of about six of them. Again, I think while Jim was away on holidays. And he came back and he found me doing these drawings. He said, what are you doing? You're meant to be doing working drawings here. So he took all the drawings away and brought them upstairs to his room, as he always did. And a couple of days later, I found him in his room and he's just coloring the drawings like this, little ticks of blue and pink and blue and pink and doing the sky. And then he came down and sat opposite me and he said, can you do one more? Because I've got five, we need six. I'm sending these drawings to the Museum of Modern Art. They want drawings for my collection. And when we went to see them, there they were, framed in the, um, in the MoMA collection and signed JS. But th <laughs> they are his drawings because... No. <laughs> it was generally in architecture, there was a lot of time for thinking. Yeah. It was all... Well, it was a time when there wasn't much work, so there was an enormous amount of discussion and a real feeling that you were in a place where important things were being discussed and where architecture was kind of going through a process of change. The other thing that was going on was postmodernism. Now, yeah. is that something that came out of people with too much time to think? <laughs> and did, did people really think it, that was ever going to be built? Was it, was it a kind of intellectual game that became real? I think that by the time we left London, one of the reasons that we were maybe somewhat disenchanted with what was going on was that it felt suddenly that people were starting to build buildings with kind of historical motifs attached like badges of honour on them. And we felt this is, this is not a good thing. This is not anything we want to get involved in. Um, well, why did Jim get interested? I don't know. I mean, I think he was always still... He was always looking for some kind of edge in it because when I worked on the Clover Gallery and in that case, the, you know, a huge amount of time was spent developing the elevations of the Clover Gallery and making you know, drawing after drawing after drawing, which is what a number of us were just drawing away in the basement on different versions and Jim saying, try this, try this. So when I left, I left the office probably when that project was about to start getting into more serious working drawings as that kind of one to 50 and probably I had to make that decision, do I stay or do I go? And I probably was happy enough to go. I mean, anyway, probably want to be back in Ireland. John had already gone back. But also, I think we had always intended to go back. When we came back here to Ireland, we spent quite a lot of time looking at traditional ways of building in the landscape, looking at monastic settlements, looking at castles, tower houses, to try and find the, the kind of essential intelligence of how they're built in the landscape and not interested in their detail or motif. Which was easy because they were nearly all ruins anyway, so there was, you know, they were left in their in a stripped down form. You know, that something that's on the way to being built is not that different from something which is on the way to being deconstructed by time. So we developed a, um, a kind of um, what we would call a sort of um, 
strategy of subtraction and addition. So actually in the city block where the film centre is, the Quaker meeting hall, you came through a door in a street, went down a corridor and found unfolding the set of spaces and buildings seemed remarkably uh, appropriate for a film centre that would be like a sort of magical place that unfolded. And we were trying to negotiate a better budget for building buildings and I got them to agree that there would be a stone base put on every building in Temple Bar up to about three metres high and that would establish its publicness. And then when we came back to the office we took all the stone off our building in the photographic archive and put it all over on the gallery of photography because it was one project. We used our stone budget on one building and our brick budget on the other. And that's why they look so different because we just gabbled all the stone and stole it to make a north facing white stone public building in the city. It was to give the gallery its, its, uh, its identity. Can we, can we look at your, a few of your working methods in a bit more detail? How does, how does each project begin? So I think it begins with some kind of um, a visit and a, a kind of immersion physically and in other ways in the brief. And then I think we, we start, we definitely work together on this, on the beginning of every project. We would start sketching, overlaying on the site, thinking about about what the site suggests in terms of its its energy or its dynamic. Is that, is that why models are so important? That yeah. you're thinking 3D yeah. right yeah. from the beginning? And we cut... And, and we cut, you know, if we cut away at a model, you know, we knock a bit off it or break a bit off it or, or uh, accidentally um, <laughs> in some cases. Um, and also we can pass it back and forth, you know, mm. um, because of the nature of technology, everything anyway gets drawn in three dimensions in the computer, but it, but not really. but it comes back, no, so it comes different. back. So Sheila's watercolour perspectives, which are an important part of our work, are, are based on computer drawings. Or our cardboard models are based on measured drawings, but we always work on them by hand. I mean, I think some of the issues we have to talk about are about landscape and gardens. And this school is probably unique in having that extraordinary Victorian orchard in place. Which is also protected. Which is protected. And so there's a very nice feeling, or there will be hopefully, that at the top of the site is this kind of wild garden where people can come out from the art room. And St Angela's is a girls' secondary school, right. which has been there for 120, 30 years. And it's an amazing place with three or four protective structures built on this very steep hill. I think it's our most intensely topographical project. It's like, it's like a topographical project with the volume turned up. Um, and it's also our most intensely concentrated um, because it will end up with three old buildings and three new buildings, like a little hill town. What happened at Blackwood is we wanted to do Sterling's Leicester building and we just put it lying on its side. We just took the scheme for Leicester and lay it down. And I remember saying to Sheila, why don't we do a project that kind of just fizzles out altogether? So we were trying to get it to fade away into the forest and open out towards the green and to be honest, neither of us um, had played golf and actually when we got the brief, we didn't know it had a driving range and you were supposed to ask questions and our question was, what's the driving, what's the driving range? range? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bit exposing. Um, but Still, it won you an award. It was our first RIBA award, actually yes. because it was um, on the island, but off the Republic. So it was in the UK and we joined the RIBA at that stage um, to do the Blackwood Golf Centre and entered it therefore for the RIBA. And that was the beginning of our beautiful relationship with um, with the RIBA awards. We, we were drawing the Blackwood competition the day Sterling died and we got a phone call from um, the, the office uh, to tell us that he had died. And I mean, we were uh, extremely upset about it. And um, we didn't know what to do, and we just um, we just decided do what he would do, just keep working. I mean, I think we often say we used to say in relation to houses, uh, in a way you almost have to kind of fall in love with the client, which mm -hmm. isn't obviously, hopefully not usually a literally thing, but there is a you know, you need to to somehow find their world very fascinating and very interesting, and the combination of where they want to have their house or whatever, and in fact. At the recent opening of the LSE, you know, the client, in his speech, one of the clients said that, you know, he had 
you know, he'd fallen in love with the architecture of the building and with his architects. But some people would look at your projects and they'd say, you've been incredibly lucky with your clients. Now, the other way of it is to... No, they would The other way to look at it is, is to actually say, well, you've made them fall in love with you and that's why the projects work. We haven't had it. We've never had a decent break, I don't think. Because, I mean, we've only ever there had... some clients watching this, can't no, no, seriously, I think the only... I always think that, that we're working on... Um, with, with the, we're always on the stony road, if you know what I mean. We're always working with limited means in awkward situations with uh, um, trying to realise something greater than is possible within the remit of what we have. When we were working with a community group in Connemara West, we spoke about all the things we wanted the building to mean, from simple things like that the building responds to the form of a tree bending in the wind, to aspects of construction and structure, to the relationship with the landscape, to the relationship with the history, the tragic history of the Christian Brothers. We talked about all those things to all of the people on the board, all the local community, and people went along with it. They got it and they understood it. In the schoolyards of um, Letterfrack, the wash house was across the yard. So the boys were marched out in, in their vests to get cold showers and then to exercise in military formation up and down that courtyard until they had recovered from the cold shower. And so our idea in, say, Letterfrack was to ma make an academic garden out of that courtyard in such a configuration that would prevent anybody ever marching in it again. You couldn't have a military parade after we had finished but with you're that. obliterating the past then, which you say you don't do. No, we're not obliterating I, it because I we're keeping the building, which is the main... The, we're keeping the building. It's like a forgiveness. We're, we are trying to open up the building to the air, let it breathe again, and say... Um, there's a second chance. No, we're trans second chance. I think, Tony, we're not obliterating it. We're transforming the yeah. building or the type. We're transforming the condition to now work in a new way for a new time and a new um, community of people who have a completely different attitude to education and young people, which, of course, the building is for education. So that is that is very um, optimistic and inspiring to us that it's, it is used you know, it used to be for boys who were in effect prisoners, but now it's for young people learning about design and making of furniture and is, you know, totally positive. John Miller's Ray, I'll quote one of your own quotes back at you. <laughs> you said that um, you said that demolition is um, death, uh, but restoration is a depressing form of taxidermy. Yeah. So what's the alternative? What are we supposed to do with old buildings? Let's yeah. put it in the context, say, of TCD stables or something like that, a sort of simple little project there without a particular weight of history. Yeah, and actually that was a, yes. one of the most enjoyable projects we've ever done. And um, we did it without doing any design work whatsoever. I, d I mean, all right, we had to put one new stairs into it, but we tried to keep that calm. We, we, we just tried to go in there and read that building for what it is, and we were trying to go through that and get to its core, which is that horses used to stand around on a brick floor. There were rills in the granite which took the horse piss out. And we were saying, look, this whole building is speaking to us about the activity mm. of, of horses stomping around. And now try to keep those scratch marks and damage marks and kind of the huffle, you know, of a horse. Keep it there so that the researchers will feel they're already already in a busy place. With the, um, the press run you did at Leinster House, quite different approach. That's mm -hmm. inserting, as it were, a piece of sculpture, isn't it, really? In terms of insertion, we brought something to that, yeah. which was so, to build a little amphitheatre. And also, yeah, so the brief like was to make a democracy. place... Democracy. It was to make a place where school children yeah. could come in groups and meet their... Um, their TD, their Member of Parliament, and be talked to by them uh, before they went on a tour or after they went on a tour of the Houses of Parliament. So we, yeah, it was, we felt that our role was to bring a sort of physical embodiment of the idea of democracy. Even smaller, probably, your little milk bar. Yeah. That, that's a favourite, I believe, as a... It's the office, office, it's, it's the well, office it's sandwich bar. Lunch, yeah. lunch that was about a, a doorstep. I mean, you know, I mean, when, you, when push comes to shove, like down at the absolute 
bottom. We, we, we both really like doorsteps and little benches. If we left nothing else to the world, maybe it would just be a little bench and say, sit down here while you have your sandwich. And you will find that again at the LSE. <laughs> and in the Valley. Yes, the, yeah, uh, the, which is probably bench. around the same time, yeah. yeah. And the timber yard has mm. the, the... Well, absolutely. I mean, the milk bar was definitely a test run for Galbally. Definitely. Mm. Because all of the little... All of the... Galbally is all about threshold. You know, mm. Galbally is a to- totally normal pitched roof building in which we have applied, uh, developed thresholds. You know, we've, we've uh, impacted thresholds into a neutral block and it's amazing the effect of the amazing effect of that you know because it makes it somehow sculptural presence and it gives it civic pride and in both Galbally and Tiberyard we were trying to work with the normal materials that the context is made in so and in both cases we were very determined that somehow the whole building would be that and that the only and then where we make the the push in and slight pull forward for the thresholds that we made in the terrazzo. Um, in Timber Yard we were under a lot of pressure to make the ground floor a kind of stone clad strip of shops with residential above. But we felt that if we were to make a building which is essentially about living, about people living there, about residences, that the brick should come to the ground as it does in all the streets of the Liberties and that sense of houseness, of home is comes through the brick. I suppose everybody who uses one of those buildings should feel that they're citizens citizens of that world, you know. So when you step out in the morning out of your house and onto the street you should feel a citizen of the little subset of society that you are housed in. Okay, let's talk about the, um, the Netherlands project, the um, social housing there. That was the Delft Mm. The process we found very interesting that the way that we worked, we worked in workshops w- attended by all the architects, by the developer and by the people from the local authority. And the developer had their own urban design department run by architects, by an urban designer run by architects. So we worked together, the three architects, in a series of workshops and then working on our own and sending stuff over to develop the master plan and then each of us built up one part. And ours was mixed use um shopping, a lot of shopping on the bottom two floors, but it also had a multiplex cinema. And was it quite liberating to find yourself working in a different uh, yeah, I environment, think so. shall we say? <laughs> I think that the whole confrontation with, let's call it, a planned uh, economy was very interesting for us and probably was a liberation, uh, especially at their idea that the architect's ideas are part of the discussion of the uh, long-term um, social planning of the development. That part was really interesting. Mm. What is not so liberating is uh, when you find that um, you can't control the built quality because the whole um, achievement of buildings or the realisation of buildings in Holland, in our experience, is managed by um, specialist uh, executive um, firms that are appointed by the clients and the architect isn't really welcome on site, and especially the sort of architect who likes to review things when they're on site might be especially not welcome. So we had to walk away from that a little bit. And what about the school that came to Gloucester? I think it's the same story. The same story. Same yeah. story. We're very, very actively involved in the design and then um, uh, slightly d- disenfranchised by the construction. And the selection process was we were told people would come to spend a day in Dublin and look at some of our work and visit the office and talk to us. And we said, how many people? And they said, well, either 12 or 13. We said, what? So it turned out that all of the committee, they spent a day with us and went to see Randall School, went to the office, went to see some other things. We kind of got to know them. And then as the project progressed, those same people were at every meeting about the design all the way through. So in terms of the design development and the use and the relationship between the two schools, we were, it, was, it was a very happy experience, I think. It's just when it got closer and closer to construction that, uh, that the actual physical making, the object of the building is not to our satisfaction, whereas the organisational principles and the idea are. If you look at the house we did in Hoth for Veronica okay, she had a pretty clear idea about what kind of house she didn't want. 
And in the course of those conversations, we once asked her to draw out the house that she thought she did want. Because the client was so engaged in the process that context was very clear in a way. Um, and I think we designed Hoth pretty well completely from the inside uh, or spatially without thinking about what it looked like on the outside. It's a very nice idea for a house where all the rooms open off each other and in her plan there were no corridors. So we kind of turn a little bit her plan sideways and talk to her about it as a section and then talked about it as a three-dimensional thing and kind of made up the project in conversation with her. And that's not unusual. I mean, that would be how we would start. Mm. Um, well, it should be a collaborative art form. Yeah, it, it can is, be. It can, and they have to recognise that you're the architect in the sense that not everyone is going to draw every line. But for us to come with the idea that there's something to be done here, but we don't know the answer before we start, let's just discuss it. Let, you, Sheila, you talked about um, simplicity. Um, the Kalani House is extraordinarily complex. Um, I, I, I always think of that as, as your most figurative scheme, shall we say. I made a, ske- I made a sketch of it on the site um, because uh, the site has got uh, polarised conditions. Um, the sea, the kind of hollow, uh, um, the lawn, a rock. And uh, it seemed that one possibility here would be that a kind of sprawling figure would um, solve or respond to these conditions better than a singular um, figure. In other words, we weren't going to make a perfect box. And so I realised I was going to make a kind of sprawling um, form. Did, did um, the Black Rock House come out of anything or lead to anything? The house in Black Rock is an idea that, that you can uh, walk around the inside of a house up and down it and back and forth on yourself. It's a kind of circling configuration um, because the tendency in that house is always to look at the sea. Um, but then there's a journey inside the house, uh, a little climbing journey that makes a landscape out of it. When, when does form come into your thinking? Pretty soon, pretty early. Uh, you kind of snatch it when it's passing. I mean, maybe the whole pursuit in architecture is a search for form. And most of the dissatisfactions of um, life are the the feeling that things are not honed enough in their form. None of that says what form is, I (laughs) realise, except it's the it's the holy grail. Um, I I really do think that, you know, when we started with the Sean O'Casey Centre, we had no idea at all of what we were going to do there. We thought, okay, well, this is a single story building, and we always thought it would be courtyards. And then we said that, and they were really disappointed. They said, oh, no, 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 no. This has got to be big. I said, well, it would be big, but it's kind of low. They said, no, we want a high building. I said, how do you? said, the Docklands are giving us this building. They're building all these new banks and legal offices down on the river. We want our building to be visible as well. Okay, let's talk about the manifestation of form, then, if you like, mm. the materiality of the building. Concrete is the ultimate form because. Um, and we're talking about cast and situ concrete here because you, you bring all the materials to the site, you set up the shutter, you pour it in, you take the shutter away and, you know, structure is up and the thing is rooted. It's, it, it's rooted. The purpose of Angularis is to draw people from the street into the centre, but the way the design works is by starting in the centre. So it's designing from the inside out. Um, whereas probably most of our projects um, are more measured about the relationship between inside and outside. Uh, it's the interior of Von Gellars is so caught up in itself that, <laughs> that uh, you could probably come at it from every angle, except of course there's only one way at it. But you know, within it, it, it is, it's like a void in the center. But it's a pinball. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, yeah. and I think for that reason, it's, I, I always think of it more like a medieval courtyard or something. We try to envisage the concrete as pre- dating the rest of the design, as if the concrete is the background against which all the other elements are displayed. You could blow it all away and you'd be left with a concrete shell, which would still contain the memory around which the building could regroup itself in a different design configuration. That was true of the, the Navin House, wasn't it? Yes. That principle of 
what's primary and what's secondary and was a kind of uh, position finding project for us and we have applied that probably in every project we've done since that that we've tried to say what are the elements of permanence absolute permanence and um, shiftingness where's the soft parts where's the hard parts I think we developed that in doing that little house in Navan. Do you think you give up your rights in a project when you hand it over? Oh, a very good question. Yeah. This is, now, especially in the case of a house. This is the, and we haven't done very many houses, but those that are dear to us are ones where we, you know, took them into our heads and made them. And I think there's always an ambiguity uh, perhaps especially on our part, an ambiguity when the house is finished as to whose house it actually is. There's this strange feeling that, I don't know if every architect feels this, but you sort of show up. You find yourself walking, you know, you find yourself showing up after the house is finished just to see that it's okay. And, <laughs> and it's, a bit, it's a bit weird. Um, it's quite emotional, I think, giving away the, the house. A house is a, a short story in a sense, but and it can be um, held more cleanly in the mind. So certainly those houses that mm. you're referring to, each of them has a, a a big brother or a distant relation or a, few, a further generation in 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 a public project. So th there's an experimental mm. aspect to those houses. So for sure, the Hoth house is a is a test run for what we were doing at the Glucksman. The Hudson House is a a trial for a trial experiment for the Ranala School. Um, they kind of, even if it's happening at the same time, it kind of confirms something or allows you to see something in clearer mm -hmm. terms. And uh, Kalani, uh, sleeping giant, uh, um, leads in a in a zigzag path. It leads to the LSE through so, the through uh, the lyric. Let's look at break. But those are the, I mean, brick and concrete, those are the archaic materials of architecture. That's what the Pantheon is built out of. The lyric is very, very site-responsive scheme, isn't it? Yes, it is, because it's between the street and the river, and it, it, it introduces the river to the street and the street to the river. The whole purpose of that project is to make a house for theatre where the people who are involved in producing theatre can have a kind of culture centre all their own and that the visitor can feel that they're in a place where theatre is made from scratch. So we were trying to make a building which would have that sense of um, dynamic, but also because as you come in, you see the, the big window to the river and the trees, that there is a sense of, of um, destination. And that's, that's for me what makes it singular, not, not, not generic. Yeah, yeah but that's... And, but and that, certainly the auditorium, because but, that, that womb-like, web-like... Mm. Yeah. space is unique. The auditorium is a separate project altogether um, because we decided we'd never done a theatre, maybe we'll never do one again. Let's learn as much as we can and let's push it as hard as we can. And because we were neophytes, you know, uh, and everybody around you is, a, is an expert, if so, sometimes it's interesting to trust your hunch, learn from the experts but not give way. So we kept with this idea that we were going to make an asymmetrical auditorium. And we were going to make an auditorium that had push, you know, that pushed the audience and the actors together, you know, close. Um, is brick a more malleable material than concrete? Oh. Absolutely. More versatile. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you could say concrete is more malleable because it's liquid and it's poured into a form. But brick, because brick is built out of... Um, small units which are the size of a person's hand it is it's made gradually and in a way could be made into different in, it could go in any direction the communication you know from the architect's design to the bricklayer's hand to the user's enjoyment the br brick is a is a word or an element of the language that everybody can understand and relate to and it's Im it's immensely uh, supple but in the Ranala school, we were using recycled bricks. So that was kind of interesting. So the dimension, a brick was one kind of thing, which is this given modular 
object set of bricks because we managed to source um, a supply of bricks which are very beautiful from demolished prison officers' houses uh, and there were just enough. We were looking around salvage yards because we'd found the first one in a salvage yard in 1995 or something, 94. And then we came to the extension, we found that salvage yard was gone. We found another salvage yard off the South Circular Road and I went in and it was the same guy. He just had... and. He saw me coming. Now, this was 11 years later or longer. He saw me coming across the way and he said to me, looking for more bricks, are you? And then he remembered where the last bricks came from and he had, isn't this amazing? He had 15,000 more of them from a further demolition of the same range of buildings from which the first bricks came. So at that point, it felt like a sign from the heavens. We mm. talked about mm. brick. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Something that people can yeah, relate yeah, to. Yeah. Another school, Cherry Orchard. That was a tough building, wasn't it? Cherry Orchard School was a school to be built in a very impoverished, very desolate part of the city, which had no school. And it was on a site which I suppose also couldn't be more different from Randall. It was a piece of waste ground with horses wandering on it and abandoned supermarket trolleys. And both the committee and us as a practice repeatedly said to the department you probably should appoint the principal and some of the teachers so that the school gets the benefit of having its end users as part of the client part that designed about they didn't do that and they appointed after the building was finished they appointed people to run it who simply didn't get it and so one by one the elements that distinguish the uh, sensitivity or the site-specific aspect of the project were kind of um, eradicated. The building itself happens to be very well built and I think it'll probably uh, hold itself up but the delicacies of it um, are, are uh, wiped away. Including the trees. The trees. Every single yeah. tree. Let's talk about glass. In the Gluxman uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we had already defined the building as being because it's built on, on a stepping piece of ground on low ground with a limestone escarpment at the back to the main avenue of the university and the river on the other side and then raised up in the air over your head is the galleries and then there's a space through which you walk which is outdoor and is landscape and connects to this precious lower ground with the big trees in UCC campus. We realised that in order to enclose that space that we had to make it in frameless glazing because we wanted it to be ephemeral um, to be disembodied in some way so that you would just see through it and that it would actually have this glass quality of being almost like looking through water or something. So you're trying to make a building that uh, feels like it has discovered itself or found its own identity, has come up out of the place itself and um, could it, could as well sort of vanish back into the place itself. And But it's a kind of place enhancing Maybe even it improves the sense of what... The, maybe the site for the Glucksman didn't know it was a good site until the Glucksman came onto it, if you know what I mean. And then everyone says, oh, luck, Jesus, look at the great site you had. Anyone could do a good job there. But, Which you know, has it, been said. It was just an abandoned <laughs> tennis court. The Glucksman is about... It's, it's telling you about its situation. It's a treehouse. It's a geological plinth. It's a bit of uh, campus connection. Mm -hmm. It's a... It's also uncompromisingly pretty. <laughs> the Glucksman is quite pretty. But, you know, that's because we like drawing with, with, with elegant line and it should be fluent, you know, because if you're going to go out there and build in such a special place as the lower ground, you better know how to proportion a line. I think people kind of... The receptive public get what it is we're doing. Another project, the Centre for uh, Infectious Diseases, I suppose you could say that there the, the budgetary constraints were a severe problem. We had a um, brick and masonry and concrete and stone cloud building with cast in situ concrete staircases. Um, and the whole project, I'd say, the, I think the project came in twice the budget, uh, you know, even though it had been cost tested through uh, tender stage, but the, because of the market. So we went back to the university and the university said, we want to build this building, but we can't afford this building. Um, so what are we going to do? 
And our cost analysis said, well, the problem is that the market has shifted and now steel is cheaper and wet trades are prohibitively expensive. So we could build a steel building. And uh, the university looked like they were going to um, reconsider. So we came back to the office over Christmas holidays and redesigned the building in steel and in this kind of light um, fibre cement um, panel system and brought the building back in six weeks, brought the building back to the budget price and built it at that price. As happened, you know, as happened with the Photographer's Gallery in London. And because you designed that twice, of course. <laughs> yeah. The first experience must have been a bit of disappointment. At the time, it was a terrible body blow because we had all this, we had all this kind of build-up about building in Soho, where we hung out when we were young, and building a what had been described to us as the first new publicly funded arts council building built since the Hayward was built. You know, in central London, when they uh, board pulled the plug and said. We're not going to build a new building. We're going to convert our existing building. I, I'm absolutely, I mean, we were really stunned uh, because it was such a change of tide, you know, uh, because we had gone out publicly and and um, built kind of expectation around this project. Um, so we took a little while to think about that. And then um, the gallery said, well, would you do the conversion? Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Like I think, if we if that had never been, if we had not designed the project for the new building, we wouldn't have done the extension the way we did it. I'm quite sure. So I think that the way that we extended the building upwards, the way that we used the windows, um, even the idea that the black uh, render cladding would come down over the brick like a sort of like as if it was sleeving it, which we felt was like a sort of old fashioned camera case coming over the body of a camera. Although the the new design had not been for a black building, somehow, it I don't I think it, you know it is, it's Mark Two, you know it's it's um, <laughs> photographer's gallery Mark Two. It's not, mm. um, which is an interesting thing. It's a bit like would we have done Crid the way we did if we hadn't done the first one? Do you design with materials in mind, or do they follow from the design? By and large, I would say, we have a predisposition about a material. The LSE Student Centre, the first day we visited the site, we just knew we were going to make a brick building there. There was um, some critics spoke of LSE in terms of your tortured geometry. Uh, it's a kind of, come on, it's a, let's take everything there is, let's, everything there is, like every single street, every single view, every single angle, every single geometry. Let's just, let's just let it rain, you know, and bring it all on. This is a building with 15 different functions in it and hardly any one of those functions needs the other. You know, they, they, mm. you don't need a gym to run a record station. You don't, but they all need each other to have a vibrant student life. So the, the, the password is overlap, if you like. Mm. I mean, many of those things are the life and the movement in the campus. So from however complex the geometry was, and certainly it's responding to other buildings and to angles and to the rights to light, among the lines of the geometry were always the sense of movement of um, all the different parts of the campus down those kind of knotted little tangle of streets into the building. This is a freestanding individual building that welcomes all comers and has got its muscles flexing. Mm. Um, so we played it hard, I think. Um, what I hope comes out of it is quite a calm building, which is very easy to orient yourself in and from which you can see back out into the university landscape um, which you have adopted as your home territory for being a student and it'll give you a bit of uh, it'll give you a bit of a lift in the morning can we um, address the elephant in the corner of your careers if I can put it like that this is going to be. you've won the gold medal yes <laughs> which is about an it's about ideas behind the work yeah. but you've never won the supreme prize for buildings the UK, yeah. ironically, the Sterling Prize. So why is that? And we've both judged the Sterling Prize, so we have some knowledge from the other side as well. Um, 
sometimes, I don't know, we think our buildings might be a little bit too up front. Um, it's, it's hard to answer. We probably need to ask the judges of well, the Sterling well, Prize we, how we well, haven't yeah. won it. Yeah, as you say, you have been that. But, I mean, I worry about, I've been worrying about it a lot. <laughs> and I keep coming back to the question of, is it a matter of taste and fashion? Um, and don't think, I'm not thinking in any ways that we're relating you to fat or anything like that, but your buildings are challenging in the way that fat buildings mm -hmm. are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And die-hard modernists want to eschew complexity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your buildings are complex. Yeah. So is that an issue? Do you think that's what people can't? Get. There may be that there's a sort of sometimes a feeling on the Sterling jury that they're they're looking for consensus and maybe the kind of architecture that we do doesn't um, invite consensus. There are lots of people we know who are extremely positive, say about the LSE building. We've had you know fantastic critical reviews and um, response from architects, but maybe it's never going to be the one that everybody agrees is fine. Whereas, you know, because there are aspects to it that some people might just find tortured or whatever, or, or in some way not rational enough for their taste. So if the prize is decided on the basis of consensus, maybe, you know, they're not, it's not that, they're not those kind of buildings. And I think, what, I think I mean, what's hard for us, though, because, um, you know, we have won uh, awards and, you know, we know about that. Uh, What's hard for us in the case of the Sterling Prize is that we have this sentimental attachment to um, a feeling of responsibility that we that we cut our teeth and were given credence. You know, our, in our early career, we were supported by Sterling, recognizing that we had that we were searching to find our own voice, and he was encouraging us. I just have this fantasy um, that I would take the prize and give it back to Jim in some stupid way um, which I know you can't do for, you know um, um, but I would do it through to his family and that then some circle will be closed and um, that I'm afraid clouds our, mm -hmm. our perspicacity on yeah. this matter because it's emotional and so if you say um, you know if you say that we is it is a cause of pain to us not to have won the Sterling Prize, you know, it, it certainly is, but I mean, we were able to deal with that pain, I think, but it certainly is. Um, but uh, that's maybe it was, maybe we had too much expected that we might have the good fortune to win the Sterling Prize. Yeah. But we never expected that we would get the RIBA gold medal because we've never built a big building because we never probably no, we just put think. ourselves, we never... We never imagined our names on that wall. Mm -hmm. You both live architecture, don't you? I, th I, mm. I was re reading your space for architecture and I thought there were two telling moments that you recalled. One, one was breaking your honeymoon to go to the opening <laughs> of the, the Stats Gallery. Yeah. And the other was, was, the second was choosing your Roman holiday cafe mm. so you can watch the light, play of light on the path, <laughs> uh, on the, the Pantheon, sorry. Is it, it is the most important thing in life? Today I was, this woman from the Sunday Business Post who was interviewing us and when she asked me your, your height and your, and your, uh, your, your favourite book, her next question was, hobbies? And I said, architecture. And she said, no, no, really, what, what are your actual hobbies? And I said, architecture. You know, swap. when we go on holidays, we, we look at architecture. It's a hobby. Um, Alvar Alta said a great thing, I think, a consoling thing, is that um, it's impossible for an architect to change the world. We have to recognise this, but we can damn well set it an example. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I, I think whenever we're doing anything, in some way we're trying to bring it around so that it stands for something and it says it clearly. I'm not sure about here is just whether the paving should be 
coming out of this geometry or whether the paving should be steady to the mm. street. You know, we have this double life that we both teach and we work in the office. But there's a wonderful moment between the office and the teaching. And you have this little moment of escape if you're just in a cafe or on your bicycle or something in between. And suddenly, the problem which was on your desk in the office is solved. We're getting, yeah. I think we're getting away with something quite good. Yeah, I and think. it's on yeah. access with the Danube, so we have that yeah. unique perspective, which is... Uh, Budapest. Yeah, Budapest. <laughs> <laughs> so we... we we read, we draw, we walk, we write, but probably all of it is architecture is throughout all, you know, is the subject, is the music running through all of our, you know, head all the time, I think.